Hi everyone, I'm Michael Guadagna and I will be your lecturer for today's session on vestibular disorders. Today, we'll be delving into the different vestibular disorders that you will likely encounter in the future. This includes their common clinical course and how they will affect your interactions with the patient. This includes things such as whether or not to discontinue the session and or modify the session plan. Before we begin, I would first like to acknowledge and thank Sir Christopher Keiko for creating and developing this module that we will be using today. Our objectives for today are tailored to equip you with the skills needed to navigate real-world scenarios effectively. The first, to understand the clinical course of common vestibular disorders referred to physical therapy. This knowledge will empower you to recognize and address these conditions promptly and improve patient outcomes and quality of life. Next would be to identify contraindications to physical therapy. By understanding when not to intervene, you'll ensure patient safety and avoid exacerbating symptoms or causing harm during treatment. Now, by achieving these learning objectives in particular, we hope that you will be able to provide optimal care to your patients in the future. Now, before we begin, I highly suggest to you guys that you review the anatomy and function of the vestibular system. I've already double-checked the links provided here in the module, and they are very useful as a refresher on the topic. Now, I would like to emphasize to you guys that anatomy and function will always be important in our field. It was important back then, it is important now, and it will be important in our future practice. So please don't be ashamed if you have to go back and review some things that you may have forgotten. No worries. For the purposes of this lecture, however, let's do a quick crash course. So the vestibular system consists of specialized organs, including the otolith organs and the semicircular canals. The otolith organs, comprised of the saccal and otuple, are the two gravity receptor organs. They contain otopania, which are like tiny stones inside the inner ear composed of calcium carbonate. The saccule detects movement along the XZ axis, such as jumping up and down or riding in an elevator. In the the utricle senses movement along the X and Y plane, like moving forward or backward in a car. Moving on to the semicircular canals, these structures are responsible for detecting angular motion of the head. They operate along rotational axes and come in three pairs, posterior, superior, and horizontal. Each canal has a crystal and ampulla at its end, facilitating the detection of the rotational movements. Together, these components of the vestibular system work harmoniously to provide us with a comprehensive sense of orientation in space, enabling us to navigate the world around us with precision and stability. Now, as a quick aside, let's delve deeper into the mechanics of the otoconia and hair membranes, which play pivotal roles in sensory transmission. Otoconia, as stated earlier, the crystals within the otolith organs of the inner ear. These structures are responsible for detecting movements and delivering sensory information to the brain. Now, within the otolith organs, otoconia are connected to hair membranes. These hair membranes consist of tufts of hair-like structures that respond to changes in position. When the body changes position, the surrounding fluid, known as endolymph, slips within the canals. The movement of endolymph is crucial for stimulating the hair membranes. The endolymph, which is the fluid inside the canals, pushes against the otoconia during movement. However, in the semicircular canals, there are no otoconia, only tufts of hair. It is the movement of the endolymph that determines whether the hair membranes are excited or inhibited. Now, taking a closer look at the hair membranes, you'll find a long piece of hair fiber with its structures called stereocilia and kinocilia. When the movement of the endolymph pushes towards the kinocilium, it sends excitatory signals. Conversely, if it pushes against the stereocilia, inhibitory signals are produced. This intricate interplay between autoconia, hair membranes, and endolymph is essential for accurately detecting changes in position and maintaining balance. Now, let's move on to distinguishing between peripheral and central vestibular pathology, as understanding the underlying mechanisms is crucial for effective management. First off, peripheral vestibular pathology involves structures of the peripheral vestibular system, such as the autolith organs and the semicircular canals. This may result from mechanical problems or decreased receptor input. For instance, if the issue lies within the central nervous system, it is categorized as central vestibular pathology. This could include conditions like stroke, where vestibular apparatus remains intact, but central processing is affected due to compromised blood supply to the processing system. In cases of central vestibular pathology, adaptation to the changes is crucial. Patients may require interventions focused on adapting to the altered sensory input. Conversely, now, Peripheral vestibular pathology often necessitates mechanical treatments to resolve issues within the vestibular structures themselves. Now, with that said, let's move on to our first uh, peripheral disorder known as BPPV. This is characterized as a mechanical disorder within the vestibular system. 
Symptoms of BPPV include nystagmus, which is involuntary, rapid, and repetitive movement of the eyes, accompanied by vertigo with changes in head position. Nausea, often accompanied by vomiting during episodes of vertigo, and disequilibrium, leading to a loss of balance and potential falls. It is important to be aware of these kinds of symptoms ahead of time because uh, nausea and disequilibrium could lead to difficulties in handling a patient session. Now, during assessment of BPPV, it is essential to elicit symptoms by putting the patient in stressing positions. The appearance of symptoms, particularly nystagmus, indicates a positive diagnosis. Now, as you can see here, nystagmus typically begins within 15 seconds of the head being placed in a provoking position and lasts less than 60. Nystagmus is typically characterized by disruption of the vestibular ocular reflexes, resulting in pendulum-like eye movements, indicating a lumbar function and gaze stability. Now, as you can see here, the cause of this function is caused by a misplaced otoconia, and it becomes dislodged from the utricle and falls into the SCC. When the otoconia falls and gets stuck into the gelatinous area, known as the cupula, it is known as cupulolithiasis. Treatment involves usually forceful movement to dislodge the otoconia. Canalithiasis, meanwhile, is where in uh, autoconia remains free floating within the SEC, disrupting normal vestibular function. Treatment usually involves uh, changing positions. Alright, so here are some further reviewings in regards to BPPV. Uh, you can watch these on your own time. However, the main takeaways are the following. The first is that BPPV can occur suddenly or be triggered by trauma, infection, chronic illness, or other factors. Next, treatment for BPPV typically involves guided head movements performed by a physical therapist to reposition the dislodged otoconia crystals. Next, seeking treatment is essential if symptoms persist as medication may provide temporarily but does not address the underlying issue. And finally, BPVV accounts for 20% of dizziness cases and can affect different spallant canals, which requires us as physical therapists to do specific treatment maneuvers for each type. Moving on, the next disorder on our list is the unilateral vestibular hypofunction, or UVH. UVH often stems from issues like uh, viral infections, trauma, or vascular events, leading to reduced or absent receptor input in the vestibular system. Uh, this disruption manifests as vertigo, nystagmus, or oscillopsia, the sensation that the surrounding environment is constantly in motion when it is in fact stationary, and instability. Initially, Vertigo and nystagmus occurs due to the imbalance created by the malfunctioning vestibular system. Typically, however, they subside within a week. This is pertinent as knowing that the symptoms themselves are self-limiting is helpful when uh, scheduling the session plans. Additionally, this also may ease concerns with the patient who is experiencing vertigo and nystagmus. For vertigo that persists beyond two weeks, however, may indicate chronic UVH, requiring specialized vestibular rehabilitation. Meanwhile, other impairments like uh, visual blurring and postural disability may persist uh, beyond one week. This is usually where we as physical therapists come in and address them. Alright, so that concludes our discussion on uh, PNS uh, pathologies. Now let's move on to the CNS. So the CNS pathologies encompasses various conditions, often linked to disruptions in the critical CNS components. Uh, most well known is the different types of stroke, like ICA, PICA, and the vertebral artery stroke which is really to significant uh, vestibular symptoms. Additionally, uh, this can also occur in uh, motor vehicle accidents. It is essential to consider vertebral bacillar insufficiency, as visual dysfunction, drop attacks, and unsteadiness are indicative signs. Uh, vestibular symptoms may also manifest in cases of TBI, or demyelinating diseases like multiple sclerosis, further emphasizing the diverse origins of the CNS pathologies. So we'd just like to emphasize during our assessments and uh, diagnostic testing, special attention must be given out to ruling out vertebral basilar insufficiency, as inadequate blood flow through the vertebral basilar artery can lead to vertigo, nausea, and dizziness due to insufficient brain perfusion, which may cause difficulties or problematic events during uh, patient care sessions. Alright, so here is a table comparing the CNS versus uh, PNS uh, vestibular pathologies. Um, please take your time to uh, pause and uh, look over the table if you need some time to read over it. I would just like to point out some highlights, specifically that for nystagmus, uh, for the CNS, um, nystagmus is usually pendular with no upbeat or downbeat, uh, same oscillation, same speed. While in peripheral, it is, as you can see, it's kind of more jerky. 
And while for peripheral uh, vestibular pathology, it has more severe symptoms of vertigo. Additionally, symptoms may include hearing loss, which is usually insidious but recoverable. While in CNS, hearing loss is usually more rare, however, it is sudden and usually permanent. Alright, next so we have a table categorizing nystagmus based on SEC location and the mechanism of BPPV. The direction of nystagmus indicates which semicircular canal is involved, where in rightward nystagmus suggests right SEC involvement and leftward nystagmus suggests left SEC involvement. However, specifically for horizontal SEC, it is important to consider whether it's a geotropic or geotropic, which color it's more with gravity rather than the patient's left or right side. So geotropic nystagmus means the nystagmus moves towards the floor, while a geotropic means the nystagmus moves away from the floor. For horizontal SEC in particular, uh, BPPV will be present regardless of whether the head is positioned to either side, left or right. Alright, so here are some uh, video links to different types of nystagmus. Upward nystagmus is for upward uh, fast-paced eye movements, downbeat is for downward uh, eye movements, and geodropic nystagmus is when the eye movement is influenced by gravity, rather than, let's say, the patient's left or right. So now let's discuss other diagnoses involving the vestibular system. The first being Meniere's disease. So Meniere's disease presents with a constellation of symptoms, as seen here in the PowerPoint. And during these episodes, symptoms can intensify and last for several hours, making vestibular rehabilitation contraindicated. Patients may experience dizziness, nausea, and earfulness due to membrane expansion, along with potential hearing loss resulting from the cochlear compression due to the increase in endolymphatic fluid, leading to distension of membranous tissues. Meniere's disease itself is uh, incurable, however, it still can be managed, specifically by preventing fluid buildup. This is commonly done by doctors through the use of diuretics, commonly used for hypertension. It aids in reducing fluid buildup by increasing urination. This mechanism helps manage Meniere's disease by decreasing endolymph volume and alleviating symptoms. So once endolymph volume decreases and the other symptoms are alleviated, that is when we as physical therapists can come in and treat the patient. Alright, so moving on to our next condition, we have perilymphatic fistula, which arises from the rupture of the membranes that separate our middle and inner ear. It is usually characterized by symptoms like vertigo and hearing loss which often causes it to, be, to resemble vestibular dysfunction. However, paralymphatic fistula is characterized by paralymph leakage and is often accompanied by pain, necessitating caution with interventions. For most of the clinical course of the disease, physical therapy will be contraindicated until post-operative clearance is obtained. Once medically cleared, however, we, as physical therapists, can play a vital role in addressing vestibular hypofunction. It bears repeating, but please remember that the Meniere's disease and perimemphatic fistula are conditions contraindicated for physical therapy unless otherwise medically cleared. Now, aside from these conditions, other contraindications for physical therapy include the following. A sudden loss of hearing, an increased feeling of pressure or fullness to the point of discomfort, severe ringing, post-surgical fluid discharge, and acute neck injuries, as all assessment procedures will forcefully place the neck in provoking positions. And that's the end of our lecture. I hope you learned a lot. Here are the references used in the lecture. And please stay tuned for the next one. It will be about assessment and management of vestibular conditions.